Hello there, and welcome back. I hope you're all well, and if you're in Afghanistan, I hope with everything I have that you're as safe as can be in this dark and terrible time. And that's what we're going to talk about today, Afghanistan and the situation there. Over the last few weeks, a lot has been said about this topic, ranging from rampant glee at the end of a US and European involvement in the country, to abject horror at what it will mean. I want to talk through the perspectives and take a look at just what has happened and why it is happening. So some background first, because you cannot understand this conflict without understanding the preceding ones. It is a complex tapestry of interconnected events and players that, from a geopolitical perspective, is an interesting picture and one I hope you can appreciate by the end of this video. I'm going to give you a bit of background on Afghanistan's history, the Soviet period, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, the US intervention and where we go from here. Afghanistan has always stood on the crossroads of empires. Because of the difficulty of the terrain, it made it a vital strategic tool, but also left it difficult to hold. However, in antiquity, the Persians and Alexander were both successful. The Diadochi abandoned the more eastern parts of the empire and modern day Pakistan because of the difficulty of getting around Afghanistan. It just formed a natural barrier, a natural buffer state. In more modern periods, it formed the chessboard of the great game between the British Empire's crown jewel of India and Imperial Russia, pressing further south. The British Empire wanted to protect its territories in the Middle East, particularly access to the Suez Canal and India via land. To do this, they wanted to create a de facto puppet state in Afghanistan, dismantle Persia and prop up the Ottoman Empire to ensure that Russian expansion south was checked. It basically amounted to wanting a secure land and sea route from Suez to Mumbai. As Russia rose in the 1800s, they wanted to expand further south to put together their own enormous empire. This was known as the Great Game and led to several proxy wars in the area. The British Empire had a very tough time of it and were defeated in the First Afghan Anglo War, though, contrary to popular opinion, the Second Afghan Anglo War resulted in a decisive victory for the Empire and led to the end of the Great Game in which Afghanistan became a British buffer state. Fun little fact, Dr Watson, Sherlock Holmes' partner, is a veteran of the Second Afghan War. Afghanistan rose up towards the end of the First World War and secured independence after the Third Anglo-Afghan War. Fast forward to just over a half century from that conflict in the 1910s to the 1970s, and though the entire axis of the world had changed, this conflict started up again. The United States started to sell weapons to Pakistan to prevent a Soviet incursion south towards India, especially as the Sino-Pakistan Pact had led to a border defeat of India. The Americans refused to sell weapons to Afghanistan out of fear they would be used against Pakistan. The Soviets wanted to weaken Pakistan out of their hostility towards the United States and also China. A decade after these initial moves, a bloodless coup overthrew Afghanistan's monarchy as Soviet-backed officers took control of the country. Two radical Marxist parties with divergent communist views backed a revolution in 1978 known as the Saw Revolution. This resulted in the assassination of the president and a new Marxist state being set up, and most importantly, an outright alliance with the Soviets. The two parties had disagreements over the speed of the implementation of communist reforms and were from different social classes. The new regime, made up of the party which predominantly contained the poorer strata, promptly executed and purged almost 20,000 people who formed the other faction, the more moderate faction, so that the Soviets would have no choice but to back this regime. The revolutionaries attempted to pursue a campaign of modernization around Soviet-style reforms, including state atheism and modernization of the economy. These pushes ran contrary to the deeply conservative culture and view of Islam that many Afghanis held. This caused deep instability and resulted in several uprisings. The General Secretary of the Politburo, Nur Muhammad Taraki, asked Brezhnev for outright support, but Brezhnev warned that this would not work out and would result in more danger for Afghanistan because it would draw the ire of the United States. He advised Taraki to ease up on the social reforms and do what the Purge Party had suggested, go slow. Taraki and his successor, Hafizullah Amin, did not listen and launched even more aggressive social reforms. This led to huge unrest and a regime that brooked no opposition then executed thousands, perhaps as many as another 20,000 in that period between 1978 and 79. These were mostly imams, village leaders and headmen. This led to entire sections of the country rising up in outright rebellion. This was no longer simply discontent, but civil war. 
Following the Islamic Revolution in Iran, the CIA and the United States feared another Soviet-aligned anti-American regime in that portion of the world, particularly with what it would mean towards US strategic interests in the region. As a result, despite the very public falling out between President Jimmy Carter and Zia ul Haq, the President of Pakistan, the United States started to assist Pakistani intelligence in training, funding and helping spread the ideology of the rebels. US analysts correctly predicted that Afghanistan would be a tar pit and it was their intention to ensure that this tar stuck and turned Afghanistan into the Soviet Union's Vietnam. This led to an initial commitment from Jimmy Carter of $500,000 for non-lethal aid. The brutal Amin regime, mired by corruption and revolutionary zeal, were caught flat-footed by the Mujahideen groups that sprung up in revolt. The KGB predicted that despite Soviet equipment and training, the Amin regime could not stand on its own and within a matter of weeks, the Mujahideen fighters would be in Kabul and overthrow the regime. Considering the weight of the propaganda victory, this would be for the United States and also crucially, the loss of a strategic ally and the inflammatory effect of an Islamic Republic of Afghanistan lighting up support for the persecuted Muslims in the Soviet steppes, Andropov and others pushed Brezhnev into committing Soviet troops directly into the conflict. The initial plan was to replace the hardline communist Amin with a more gradualist approach from the exiled Kamal, leader of the more moderate communist faction to stabilise the situation and pacify the Afghani population. The decision makers in the Kremlin dismissed advice to the contrary and viewed Afghanistan as a chess piece in the Cold War, rather than looking clearly at the situation in Afghanistan for Afghanistan. This was a huge mistake. Over 100,000 Soviet troops flooded the country, executed Amin and put Kamal in place. Despite Kamal's more moderate approach, he was seen by the local Afghanis as nothing more than a stooge for the godless communists. The international community reacted with horror and with condemnation at the Soviet invasion, though the Soviet Union took control relatively easily over the area in the initial stages. However, civilians quickly rose up, helping the Mujahideen, and the Soviets rapidly lost control of the situation. Similar to the Ottomans in the First World War in the Arabian Peninsula, they controlled strategic points of a country and maintained those corridors, but were unable to exert control outside of those areas. Whilst they won most of the battles they participated in, as soon as they left the area, the Mujahideen would simply return. This would be compounded by the fact that the Soviets expected the Afghani army to do the fighting and for the Soviets to have a lighter support role. Many of the Afghani soldiers were loath to fight as it was just a paycheck for them and they were assigned the dangerous infantry roles while the Soviets were in mostly armoured or air battalions. In the 80s, the Mujahideen movement really took off with cooperation between conservative Deobandi sects and Wahhabi Saudis. Thousands upon thousands of young men volunteered to fight for their fellow Muslims against godless atheist Soviet oppression, including a very young Osama bin Laden. The US encouraged and funded this, though I do want to clear up a misconception. Osama bin Laden and most of the foreign volunteers were not formally part of the Mujahideen. They were volunteers who were separate and so received no direct funding or help. However, obviously, the Mujahideen fighters did then share the equipment, funding and training they received with the foreign volunteers. Despite being outnumbered, the Soviets won a surprise victory at Jalalabad after being incensed at the treatment of the dead by non-Afghan Salafists who had systematically dismembered the corpses of Soviet troops as an indication of the fate awaiting those left alive. This intensified the conflict and led to mounting atrocities from all sides. Though it is seldom mentioned now, the Soviets raped many women and destroyed local communities wherever they could, actions similar to the behaviour of many US soldiers in Vietnam to try and break the back of local support for the Mujahideen. I have to emphasise the fact that the Afghani Mujahideen and the foreign volunteers were at no point a centralised homogeneous group. In fact, they were incredibly fragmented and chaotic. Often, they were split along ethnic and religious lines, and as I have stated previously, Islam itself is not a unified religion but made up of many sects and traditions. These differences, often cross-pollinating with ethnic lines, meant that several separate warlords fought the Soviets only when the Soviets took the field and then fought each other when the Soviets weren't around. The Afghani intelligence services did its absolute best to encourage this infighting and though it is impossible to know just how effective they were, it has been estimated that they were excellent at this and managed to foment massive amounts of division and infighting. Keep this fact in your head, it will become key later on. 
the American media went out of their way to portray the Mujahideen as brave godly fighters striving against an evil empire, Dan Rathers in particular being an egregious example of this. We all of course know of Rambo showing up with his machine gun and unintelligible screams as the white American saves the brown people from the awful Soviets. The Soviet Union, understanding that the situation was untenable, began to draw up an exit plan which consisted of first building up the Afghani army to a sizeable force, arming and training them and finally relying on them to do the fighting whilst the Soviets picked up and left. Gorbachev with his new vision for the Soviet Union decided to accelerate the exit and it was one of the conditions for renewal of Sino-Soviet relations and so the Soviets started to withdraw in 1987 ending in 1989. Please remember, this was not a military defeat for the Soviet Union, it became an untenable situation as the Soviets were unwilling to pursue the cost of victory or even staying in the region, especially as Brezhnev's appalling leadership had stagnated the Soviet economy and so Gorbachev wanted this albatross gone. Whereas previously Afghanistan boasted an intellectual class, religious scholars and a civil society, after this decade long war where all of those groups were either murdered or had fled, only the armed Mujahideen remained, only the law of the gun remained. Once the Soviets had left, the United States and the United Kingdom washed their hands of the people they funded, leaving them to do with Afghanistan as they wished. This promptly devolved into straight up civil war round two, Mujahideen on Mujahideen on Afghani civilian. Throughout the 90s, foreign involvement in Afghanistan largely disappeared and the Taliban founded in 1994 became the big winners of a civil war, taking control of most of Afghanistan with only Abdullah bin Massoud's northern alliance remaining independent of a Taliban regime, which now sets the stage for the second part of this video, the US led invasion. Now before we continue, I want to make it clear that Al Qaeda are not the same as the Taliban, Osama bin Laden never held any official position in Afghanistan or indeed inside the Taliban, they are two linked but distinct entities, in fact you could characterise Al Qaeda as a state within a state. So who are the Taliban? Well this is a little complex. They were officially founded in 1994 around October and November of that year and are a combination of different Mujahideen groups that were veterans of a Soviet Afghan war. Several of the various Mujahideen groups leaders realised that to end the violence they would need to unite around a common grouping, they asked Mullah Omar to be their leader. He first refused and then accepted. The etymology of the name is how the Taliban see themselves, it is from the word Talib which means student in Pushto as in the Taliban are perpetual students of Islam. Their ideology is difficult to distill, many of the original Taliban were children of conflict, children who were born without their elders and of course in the tribal system it is the elders that provide that vital education going forward. With the demise of the elders, the intellectuals and even the imams, many of these children were uneducated, illiterate and completely ignorant. All they had was inherited tribal customs and religion, they got parts of a religious education, syncretised them with the tribal system and that is how you have the Taliban's rules. You can see the strict Deobandi influence on their behaviour, you can even see Salafi and Wahhabi influences imported from the foreign volunteers of the Mujahideen period. There's also a more pragmatic approach from the Taliban which is seldom recognised. To them and to their rank and file, war means employment, peace means unemployment. In a war torn country with no economy, no employment means starvation and so from a pragmatic position the Taliban needed to keep their soldiers active. They've done this by using the continual oppression of women as a reason to keep the men employed. After all give the men a reason to oppress women and you've got plenty of employment and the feeling of power. Interestingly, the Taliban have a love-hate relationship with drugs, particularly heroin. Throughout the 90s they rejected it and attempted to stamp it out, something like 90% of the drug trade in Afghanistan was gone because of their actions. During and after the insurgency period, the Taliban turned to the drug trade to fund their activities. Now that they control Afghanistan, will they return to the policy of zero drugs? This is something that will be worth paying attention to. Al Qaeda are different to the Taliban. The Taliban were mostly of the Pashtun ethnic and social group, the predominant ethno-cultural group in Afghanistan. Al Qaeda is a ragtag collection of nationalities from around the world, but primarily are made up from people from the Arabian Peninsula. Whilst Al Qaeda's view is that injustice to Muslims anywhere must be met with force, the Taliban are solely concerned with Afghanistan and the section of Pakistan they believed belonged to Afghanistan. Beyond that, the Taliban were content to limit their activities to the borders of Afghanistan. Al Qaeda had no such concept. 
most of the fighters of Al-Qaeda who were veterans of the Soviet-Afghan war had little to no care for Afghanistan the territorial entity. What they cared about was the Islamic character of the Afghani people being lost under the threat of godless communism. Bin Laden's original goal was to take the fight to the Soviet Union and expand out onto the Islamic Asian steppe. So Wahiri's goal was to foment revolutions in Islamic countries where Islamic rules did not exist, what most of the people inelegantly called the Islamic world. Neither considered the US a target at this point in the 80s. Al-Qaeda, the organisation and the people that made up the organisation considered themselves to be a borderless legion of God who would fight wherever and whenever they needed to, to end the oppression of Muslims in their warped world view. Despite governmental and news media attempts to conflate the two, significant tension has existed between them, with many of the poor native Taliban resenting the Al-Qaeda leadership for their often wealthy backgrounds and frequent displays of privilege. Often, the Al-Qaeda base was secular educated, in contrast to the religious education of the Taliban. It's a curious dichotomy that does not fit established cultural understandings of the two especially when it seems that Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban in the 90s, wasn't even aware of 9-11 until after it had happened. The Taliban's view is rooted in Pashtun culture. You can't understand Afghanistan if you don't understand Pashtun Wali. Despite claims to be rooted in original Islamic thought, Pashtun Wali predates Islam's arrival in Afghanistan. Historians have tentatively linked the Paktas and the Paktians in Hindu and Greek sources respectively with the Pashtun people. An interesting tidbit is that it is a cultural origin myth for the Pashtun people that they are descended from one of the exiled tribes of Israel. Pashtun Wali is the entire cultural framework through which all of the Pashto ethno-social group are educated in. It is literally the very code of their lives. It is rooted in over a millennia's worth of tribal understanding and development and you can see this in the way it operates. There are roughly 13 principles that make up the code of ethics in Pashtun Wali. The three main principles are hospitality, showing hospitality and respect to visitors regardless of where they come from and regardless of the wealth or status of a visitor. Pashtuns take incredible pride in being hospitable and I myself have experienced this amongst diaspora communities. Asylum, people are protected at all costs once refuge is given. It goes in tandem with hospitality and it's an absolute law that Pashtuns will not break. It is considered highly dishonourable. This code is even extended to defeated enemies who can seek asylum with the victors who will protect them. Justice and revenge. Pashtuns have a categorical duty to seek justice or take revenge against the wrongdoer. No matter how much time elapses, no matter how difficult, one must strive for this at all times when a slight has been committed. The other principles are bravery. A Pashtun must always show courage in defending his land, property and family. Cowardice is a capital offence. Loyalty. Pashtuns owe loyalty to family, tribe and friends. Kindness. Pashtuns must act with a common good in mind. Arbitration in Pashtun Wali is handled through tribal councils known as Jirga. Faith. Pashtuns are expected to show trust and faith in God. Respect and pride. A Pashtun's pride must never be insulted and must conduct themselves with that pride in mind. They must treat themselves and others with respect at all times, otherwise they're not worthy of being a Pashtun. Honour of the woman. Pashtuns must always defend the honour of women at all costs and must protect them from verbal and physical harm. Killing women except under the law is explicitly and inherently forbidden. Manhood or chivalry. Pashtuns must always act as men and demonstrate chivalry. Their turbans are a sign of their manhood and chivalry. Country. All Pashtuns are obligated to protect the land of Pashtuns and Pashtun customs against any invader that would see either damaged. That is the code by which Pashtuns who make up the plurality of Afghanis live by. The Northern Alliance, which was the Taliban's main enemy in the post-Soviet world, was made up of a coalition of different ethnic groups which opposed the Taliban's Pashtun right to rule approach. The fighting rumbled on through the 90s and continued on throughout the 2000s. We're now at the part which you're all actually here for. September the 11th, the United States intervention and the 20 year war on terror. By the late 1990s, the Taliban continued to wage war against the Northern Alliance and Al-Qaeda had left Afghanistan, turning their gaze away from the former Soviet states. Zawahiri still wanted to foment revolution and overthrow the corrupt dictatorial regimes of the Middle East, but Bin Laden's gaze had turned away from the East towards the United States. 
The first major issue for bin Laden occurred during the first Gulf War, where United States troops garrisoned the Arabian border with Iraq and Kuwait. The presence of American troops in Arabia incensed bin Laden and he considered it blasphemous, especially when his own group was passed over when he offered their support to defend the nation against Saddam Hussein. He also considered Operation Desert Storm a blatant Soviet-esque power grab to steal Islamic resources for American purposes. Bin Laden was exiled from Arabia for his criticism of the king. He moved to Sudan where he set up training camps. Following the Oslo Accords, which Saudi supported, Bin Laden viciously verbally attacked King Fahad again, which led to the revocation of his Saudi citizenship, his removal from the Bin Laden family trust and public disownment. Following failed attempts in Egypt, Bin Laden was forced to leave Sudan. Bin Laden returned to Afghanistan, where that symbiotic relationship I mentioned earlier continued with Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda helping train some of the Taliban's elite brigades in exchange for hospitality. Bin Laden, outraged by what he saw as US encroachment on what he considered Islamic lands, began to plan attacks on the US, and indeed, Al-Qaeda in 98 bombed two US embassies in Tanzania and Kenya. This is not justification for Bin Laden, it never will be, but it is his reasons, not the asinine, the haters for our freedoms. Of course, we all know what happened on September the 11th, 2001, where two planes crashed into the World Trade Center, another into the Pentagon, and a fourth crashed after the passengers fought back. The response from the United States was one to project strength, and for a nation reeling to seek security. This attitude meant President Bush told the Taliban to hand over Bin Laden, and the Taliban denied Bin Laden was responsible. They asked for evidence of guilt presented to a neutral country, where Bin Laden would be tried under Islamic law if the United States presented further evidence of guilt. They refused to unilaterally hand him over, citing the Pashtun ethical code that I mentioned earlier, chiefly the principle of hospitality and also international law and that Afghanistan had no extradition treaty with the US. This is an interesting offer, I find, because it is almost exactly what the United States wanted, Bin Laden handed over, but the issue is that Bin Laden would have gone to a neutral country to stand trial. The issue around Islamic courts could have been gotten around, though ironically, Bin Laden would have had a harder time in a Sharia court because the Islamic rules of war strictly prohibit the targeting of civilians. Al-Qaeda's legal justification uses an obscure doctrine that they have deliberately misconstrued to justify their choices. Even more ironically, this justification is mirrored by the US in their approach to signature strikes in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen and other nations, but we'll get to that later on. The important thing here is that the Bush regime refused to negotiate, refused to talk to the Taliban who bear in mind knew nothing of the September 11th attacks and issued the famous ultimatum of the Bush Doctrine, that the United States will make no distinction between terrorists and those who harbour them, ironic really considering the US's support for the IRA. This obviously caused conflict inside the Taliban. Pashtun Wali holds the principle of hospitality and asylum in the highest regard, absent clear evidence of guilt, they could not simply hand over Bin Laden without violating some of their most important principles. What is important to note is that Bin Laden immediately said, repeatedly, that he was not responsible and he had no idea who it was. It was not until after the invasion that public evidence was found to link Bin Laden to the attacks. Indeed, in early 2002, the then FBI director, Robert Mueller, stated they had found no evidence, not even a scrap of paper linking Bin Laden to the attacks. It wasn't until November 2002 that Bin Laden's letter to America was discovered, and even then it took until 2004 before Bin Laden actually claimed responsibility. The US knew that Bin Laden was responsible as a result of deduction, but they never had hard and fast evidence until long after the invasion took place. Let me be clear, this isn't a defence of Bin Laden or Al Qaeda or anything of a sort. What it is, is an attempt to understand the frame through which this happened. Countries operate through legal frameworks. Those frameworks are vital and it is through that prism that we engage in action. The United States justified the war in Afghanistan on the principle that Al Qaeda attacked the United States and the Taliban in refusing to extradite him and them were therefore equally guilty. The United States had not provided evidence beyond some suggestive intelligence data and this didn't meet the Taliban's legal standard for extradition. Now we know in hindsight that Bin Laden was responsible. We know in hindsight that Al Qaeda planned this operation, but we also know that the planning wasn't done in Afghanistan. It was done in Hamburg in Germany and then finalized in Florida, which makes the situation even more murky. What I find even worse is that a membership list recovered around 2002 indicated that at the time of the September the 11th attacks, Al Qaeda's membership was around 150 people. 
For 150 people, the United States set fire to a country. This for the Taliban was a disastrous result. Indeed, some Taliban figures accused Al-Qaeda of abusing our hospitality later on because of what happened next. The United States invoked Article 5 of the NATO Charter, and the world's foremost military power, in conjunction with its allies, invaded a poor, war-torn country in the Middle East. The initial invasion of Afghanistan was a resounding success for the United States and the coalition. The Taliban could not withstand the force of this combined military weight in conventional warfare, and were quickly chased out of urban centres. Al-Qaeda were practically chased out of Afghanistan itself, with somewhere between 50 and 100 members present in the country by 2007. Mullah Omar quickly reorganised the Taliban, and an insurgency force using tactics based on asymmetrical warfare began. The Taliban quickly adopted these insurgency tactics using IEDs, which are improvised explosive devices, hit and run attacks, and a guerrilla campaign that bogged down US forces. In many ways, these veterans of the Soviet conflict learned and applied those lessons, and that is why the various tactics from the United States failed. However, the biggest and most important reason is because the Afghani people protected the Taliban, much as the Viet Cong and other such conflicts, the local people helped and supported the insurgents, and understanding why that is, is key to understanding the situation about why what happened, happened. This all comes down to unclear strategic objectives. What did the United States go into Afghanistan for? That is a question with no real answer. The Office for the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction SIGA, constructed a secret series of interviews across the United States and other allied nations armed forces, diplomats and policymakers. This review was done to try and learn the lessons of what happened and is a very frank assessment of the war. The US government fought tooth and nail to keep these papers from becoming public, but eventually the Washington Post's Freedom of Information request was successful and these papers became public. In conjunction with Rumsfeld's Freedom of Information released memos, they're now known as the Afghanistan Papers and comparable to the Pentagon Papers that reveal the scale of deception around the Vietnam War. In the words of General Douglas Lute, who was the Afghanistan Tsar during both the Bush and Obama years, We were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. What are we trying to do here? We didn't have the foggiest notion of what we were undertaking. The United States had no real strategic objective, and it showed. If it was to apprehend and punish Al-Qaeda, well, for an organisation that had 150 odd members in the early 2000s, flooding the country with troops was a wrong option. If it was to overturn the Taliban regime, and turn Afghanistan into a liberal democracy, well, they got everything totally wrong, again. This lack of coherence shows in the way the United States approached the Afghani people. Were they an occupied populace, a hostile populace, or an allied populace to be liberated? If you ask 20 people, you'll get 20 different answers. Now this is where I want to talk about drone strikes. The United States had two broad approaches to drone strikes. One, where they were after a specific target, had intelligence that said target was present, and then authorised a strike. The second approach was what was known as signature strikes, where a person fits the profile of an insurgent, and a strike was then authorised. A military age male, so someone over the age of 15, who fits the profile of militants, so social background, visiting certain areas, and moving over certain regions, will then be eligible for death via drone. The United States, Britain, and anyone else who uses drones in the area will certify these as militants killed or combatants killed, but privately, Pentagon officials have admitted they have got no idea who they killed and whether they were actually combatants. They've got no clue at all. Nobody knows the real numbers because at every turn, all the governments involved have twisted, turned and distorted the numbers to try and make it as obscure as possible. This is compounded by the United States' approach to collateral damage. We've all seen the various US TV shows where the president is in the situation room and has to make the difficult choice of bombing a wedding or a funeral, or a populated area to get the target. This is usually their only choice because it is too dangerous for a team to go and get them. So the president, usually a man, agonises over this choice, but almost always accedes. There's a flash on the screen, and that's all. He's clearly made the right choice, because the terrorist is dead, and that is all. What they don't show you, either on TV or in the news, is the aftermath of these strikes. The United States often double taps, because you can get more militants that way. Many of these gatherings are weddings, funerals, and family get-togethers, filled with women, children, and innocents. So on balance, the president or the drone operator has to decide whether 50 or 60 innocent lives are worth the single terrorist. 
nearly always the calculation has historically been yes, they are. And this is how we have a dehumanised enemy where brown lives are worthless. It is how we get into a situation of racism and of the atmosphere where war crimes are committed by soldiers against an abused populace. But this also displays that the United States does not understand Afghanistan at all. You remember earlier, where I talked about the Pashtunwali Code, do you remember the third point? Vengeance and justice. Now if tomorrow, a foreign government authorised a strike for someone in the neighbouring house, when all of your extended family, your nephews and nieces, your grandparents and granduncles were all here celebrating, and boom, they're all dead and maimed, you've been grievously injured. Would you support that foreign government? Would you back a domestic government they support? Or would you now have a burning rage and desire revenge with every fibre of your being? And this without the cultural expectation of vengeance and justice. US media is literally filled with revenge flicks where a main character goes and kills a bunch of bad guys because their wife or daughter or dog has been killed. Imagine if it's your entire family. In their effort to kill a single target, the United States and its allies often created legions of others seeking vengeance. Just as I was preparing this episode, the United States killed 10 innocent people in a drone strike, including 7 children. Indeed, children have testified in Congress that they fear the clear blue sky because it means the drones will be out. We made children scared of the open sky, and we are still somehow the good guys. This is not how you build a liberal democracy. In fact, it is not even how you suppress an insurgency, it's how you spark one. Is it any surprise, any at all, that Afghanis have kept the Taliban alive when the United States and its allies have acted with such a casual disregard for Afghani lives? And this is before I even mention the torture or the actual stuff the United States doesn't even want to admit. And if that wasn't enough, the United States for its own strategic interests looked the other way as the Afghani government they backed became an organised kleptocracy plundering at will. First Hamid Karzai's government and then Ashraf Ghani's. And when I say kleptocracy, well, the Kabul bank, run by Karzai's brother, which was set up as the chief funnel of US money, received hundreds of millions of dollars, yet somehow was on the verge of collapse in 2010. The reason? The people who ran the bank were giving themselves hundreds of millions of dollars in loans which they never bothered to repay. Money that was supposed to be used to fund schools and build roads. Is it any surprise? that Afghanis ended up supporting the Taliban over the US-backed government. The Afghanistan papers show clearly and demonstrably that across four administrations, Democrat and Republican alike, there has been a clear and concerted effort to lie to the public in all allied countries about the situation and state of the war. In 2006, in 2006, Rumsfeld was made aware that the Taliban are making a comeback because the Afghani people are sick of the corruption of a US-backed Karzai government and that Pakistan, nominally a US ally, was supporting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Rumsfeld had the Pentagon bury those memos. Countless documents show over and over and over that the United States knew that the war was going badly, that they lacked any clarity over objectives and that the army they were training existed on paper only. It's estimated that out of the 300,000 troops that the Afghani army supposedly holds, only 10%, 10% actually exist. The Afghani army lost double that number in the 20 years of war. And the lies went on year after year to the public. Bush, Blair, Obama, Brown, Cameron, Trump, May, Johnson, Biden. Consistently, everyone told their respective electorates that the war was going well and soon the Afghani government would be able to stand on its own two feet and yet the situation was nearly identical to that which the Soviets faced, that they controlled big urban centres and outside of those narrow corridors the Taliban ruled the land. Domestically, the United States has destroyed its reputation, arguably a false one, for respecting liberty with abominations like the Patriot Act being put in place. You've got actual serving members of Congress or the government or former members defending torture and to this day the reaction has not died down. If anything, it has gotten worse. You do not get Trump without Bush first paving the way. The entire disregard for civil liberties and othering an entire community is not without consequence. Heck, it's not even an accurate barometer, because conservative religiosity does not equal terrorism. It never has. If anything, it's likely to be an inverse relationship because even a casual reading of Islamic texts on the rules of war make it pretty clear you cannot harm those who are actively fighting against you. It's what caused Bin Laden to split with his original group, because one of the other leaders outright said that attacks against civilians are clearly forbidden. 
And in Afghanistan, the United States still doesn't understand why the populace wouldn't fall into line, because they never bothered to try and figure out what makes the local people tick. US soldiers and contractors looted, raped and killed Afghani civilians. They never tried to learn the local language or win over hearts and minds. They never bothered to try and understand the Pashtun culture that motivates much of Afghanistan's population. In the end, it was essentially a war fought by the ignorant against the ignorant. So now we come to the pullout about as successful as the other method of that name. The United States essentially cut and ran, leaving hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment behind to an army trained to use combined arms. They built this army in its own image, so using contractors to service the equipment and maintain it. The Afghanis don't have contractors, they can't afford them. They don't know how to service any of the equipment left behind. So now you've got an army that is depending on an air force, on heavy vehicles, on modern equipment, unable to use any of them in a straight shooting war against a side who knows how to fight without all of those things. Is it any wonder the Afghani army folded so damned fast? And bear in mind that there was actually very little fighting. The Taliban negotiated their way through Afghanistan. Let that hang there. They negotiated with people to come back into control. People in Afghanistan found the US-backed Ghani government so repulsive, so unworthy of support, they were willing to allow the Taliban, whom they hate, to take back control. Let that sit in your mind, and if that doesn't illustrate the level of failure that this entire conflict has been, then I don't know what will. Bin Laden is laughing in his grave because he and his 150-man posse have utterly ruined the preeminent superpower of our time. For the cost of a few plane tickets, he managed to bankrupt the US financially, socially, and morally. I want to finish this video, which has gone on long enough as it is, on the consequences of this. There has been a sense of triumphalism on the internet and amongst certain communities, talking about how it is good that this failed imperial project has come to an end. That's all well and good, but it is not you who will be paying the price, it's women and children and LGBT people. They are all going to suffer because the Taliban are ignorant and hate the very idea of an educated woman or an LGBT person. They do not brook an educated woman and they will brutally repress the population of Afghanistan. It is they who will suffer and it is they who will die and it is they who are now condemned because of our policy failures. This isn't something to celebrate or cheer. It is something to mourn. I think of the little girls who are now being told there are no places left for them to read anymore. I think of those women who courageously took a step forward and are now being told the Taliban are looking for them. I think of the LGBT people who need to flee because their very existence is a threat. Then there's the enlightened centrists or neocons or hawks who think the perpetual war in Afghanistan was somehow okay and could have continued. Newsflash, it wasn't sustainable. It never was. We made a horrendous mistake and Afghanistan is burning because of it. And I think of the response, the shameful response, from the governments that helped destroy Afghanistan, refusing to help those that need to escape, making jokes, laughing, building walls and refusing applications for refuge. This entire affair, from its murky legality, to its incoherent strategic aims, to its barbaric execution, to its shameful conclusion, is a stain on all of our countries that will not clear so quickly. This will not be forgotten, not there, not anywhere. NATO stood by and ruined a country, and then ruined it again, and when called to account for their actions, they washed their hands of it. What more can be said? What more can I say on how appalling this entire situation is? What more needs to be said that when we were needed, we weren't there? We betrayed the Afghani people, and the Afghani people are the ones who will pay the terrible price of that betrayal. That's all from me, thank you for listening. Let me know what you think either in the comment section or in the Discord server. If you can, I urge you, please help any refugee you can. There are plenty of organisations which need funds or volunteers to help resettle the people lucky enough to get out. Please do what you can, I know I will. Thank you and goodbye.